Well, speaking of originality, uh, I want to talk about something today that will probably upset a lot of people. Well, that's, I mean, I upset people every day. That's what I do. But um, this uh, goes even further than that. There's some people who believe that Christianity is this foreign, kind of third world Judaic religion. Um, it's a common error, however depressing. Old Testament Judaism has no relation either ethnically nor theologically with modern Talmudic Judaism. Talmudic Judaism is a Jews' rejection of the old law, with them collectively as the Messiah. But modern pseudo-scholarship and the subsidized universities perpetuated this myth. But what I'm arguing today is that Christ was Greco-Roman in his sympathies, much of his theology and his cultural background. And it is very easy to prove. The thesis here is that Christ was culturally Greek. He abandoned the profoundly corrupt Jewish ruling class, broke with their legal provisions, and he followed in the footsteps of the prophets and siding with those who would destroy this hegemony, the Romans in this case, as Jeremiah sided with the Babylonians against a diseased Israel. People forget that the boundaries of Europe included North Africa and most of the Levant before Islam. I mean, people are so dumb that they think that these cultural boundaries are identical 2,000 years ago as they are now. Some even think that the Middle East is the same racially and ethnically as it was 2,000 years ago. Mary, mother of God, was from a Greek city, Sepphoris. Sepphoris is the centerpiece of what I'm going to argue today. Nazareth is a, is a small section of um, either a, a, a section of the city itself or a tiny suburb. Christ was a craftsman, so he had to have spoken Greek as a man and was part of ancient Greek life. Which, of course, begs the question, and why did Christ choose this region? What's his Greek background telling us? What is it telling us? Why were the Hebrews of the era so vehemently against him from the very beginning? It's because they saw him as a foreigner. This is why they kept referring to his place of origin as a pejorative. It's true that Jesus was educated in the temple and taught in the synagogues. Now, he was called rabbi informally. He wasn't technically one. He was not part of the ruling elite at all. But where did he begin teaching? In Capernaum, another Greek city. So even though he was educated at the temple, he vehemently denied and rejected the Pharisees, and certainly the, the uh, atheist Sadducee, absolutely outside of this Jewish mainstream. Christianity is a European Greek faith, or to be nicer about it, Greco-Roman faith, or Greco-Latin faith. Most of the apostles had Greek names. The earliest apostolic writings were all in Greek. Mary's from a Greek city. They had to have spoken Greek if they did any business at all, which of course they did. The earliest synods conducted their business in Greek. Is this a coincidence? Is it a random set of events? But because of the polemical nature of this kind of thing, good research here is rare. I was shocked about how easy this is to prove. Making Christianity European is a bad idea for a lot of people. It's easy to ignore it if it's, if it's this foreign, um, development. One of these neo-pagans today who have, who have, are redefining the concept of historical illiteracy. Um, I mean, I, I could simply ask them what paganism is and just enjoy the show. They believe that Christ was a Semite, thereby making the theology illegitimate as a result, which is a colossal non sequitur. I mean, these are some of the people who believe the Middle East is the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. Some even think that Islam existed at the time. The third worldization of this part of the world came from Islam. Islamic culture, of course, came from the Greeks. But what makes their ignorance worse is that they, they fail to grasp the simple fact that prior to Islam, the Greco-Roman culture was the dominant elite culture throughout North Africa and the Levant. You also have these subliterate black nationalists subsidized by the universities who honestly believes that if someone is from Africa, they look like Tupac. Of course, Greco-Roman culture is a purely white phenomenon. The Ethiopians were certainly Semitic, not black, in the, in the sense that most people you know, mean it. Um, it was a white European phenomenon. The difference really is that you know the white neo-pagans are not mainstream. But the black nationalists are romanticized by the system every day. White students have been sent, uh, present company not accepted, have been sent to re-education seminars for questioning this dogma. But this is a battle that the historical literate have to fight every single day. Historical literacy is not only enshrined, but it's subsidized and enforced. It's easy to be ignorant. It's very difficult to be knowledgeable. 
Stupidity dominates in my field and in most fields because it's easy to be ignorant. Most of what I say, of course, it's ground for dismissal from any university, as I well know. But, of course, ideology is far more important than history. Now, I know I've made fun of the pagans here before. They don't know what paganism is, and they know zero about the cults of, of Northern Europe. Because it was an illiterate society, their theology is largely invented. Now, this is not the case for the Greco-Roman culture within which Christ was born. There you have tremendous literacy. I mean, the Stoic mind of ancient Rome is a moral utopia compared with what we have today. But the worst tragic element here is that a lot of these people, whatever their background, they bet their souls on this absurdly poor knowledge of theology, and there are very few people to correct them. The truth is convenient for nobody. Now, Christ is from Galilee. Why not just make him from Jerusalem? Galilee's other name was Decapolis. It was a very Greek part of the area, very Greek part of the Middle East. Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch, son of the, you know, murderer of the innocents, Herod the Great, and he's called the Great for his building programs, uh, subsidized by not only the caravan routes, but also Rome. And Galilee also included Capernaum and Magdala. The dominant language was Greek. Now, Tiberius is another Greek city that became the headquarters of Herod Antipas, near Capernaum. Tiberius, of course, named for the Roman emperor who ruled at the time, it became the new capital. And, of course, the few, and I, I'm, I'm telling you, at the time, religious Jews were getting fewer and fewer. You couldn't go near a city called Tiberius. And I think it's not an accident that they built it on top of a cemetery, meaning that no Jew could go there. And yet, this is where Christ creates his ministry? He's spitting at the Pharisees. He's spitting at the decayed, inbred, arrogant Jewish ruling elite and openly sides with the Romans against them. In other words, he looks to Europe, the European mainstream of which he was a part, in Sepphoris, Nazareth, Capernaum, wherever he was. And he was executed outside of Jerusalem with his back to it, facing southern Europe. Now, of course, Alexander conquered Judea, I don't know, 400 years roughly before Jesus. From there, Greek life took over the area. Now, Herod the Great was placed in power 25 years after the Romans took over in roughly 63 BC. So by the time Jesus arrived, not too long after this, the area was a mix of peoples, which isn't saying much. Every area is a mix of peoples. The dominant language was Greek. The dominant culture was Greek. The architecture was Greek. Now, there were some Jews who also had accepted the Greco-Roman culture. But what often scholars in this field don't bother to mention is that they can't be Jews anymore. You can't be a Hellenized Jew. You're not a Jew. This is not, you can't separate you know, the cultural milieu and the language from the theology. That's not how it worked back then. Sometimes, but not always, the word Gentile just meant Greek. But Judea was a cultural crossroads due to, you know, for economic reasons, but it certainly was not a Jewish region. Decapolis was not a Jewish area. I mean, the very fact that the money had human faces on it meant that no Jew could do business there because they couldn't handle that kind of money. And it's almost like people like Herod were deliberately pissing Jews off. And I think as time went on, as Greek life created stability in the area, abandoning the old Jewish life was easier and easier. It's my private thesis that one of the reasons the Jews wanted Christ dead was to up the ante. They were losing too many people. I mean, the Sadducees had abandoned religion altogether. If there's any connection between Jews now and then, it's them, even though it's a different ethnic group. By murdering Christ, they said, this is what's going to happen if you guys abandon us anymore. But because Jews, so-called Jews, were doing all of this business with this area, they couldn't have been very good. I think observant Judaism was very small at the time. Whatever Jews there were, of course there were plenty, but they were not unified. Many were Hellenized. And the minute they become Hellenized, they're no longer Jews. You know, people like Philo of Alexandria, I, I get all that. But the Jewish nationalist movement had rejected that completely. Now, Decapolis, which was the real name for Galilee, um, spread both south and east the southeast side of the Sea of Galilee. It was a region of ten Greek cities, hence the name, on the fringe of the Roman Empire. The very fact that there was a fairly large Roman military presence there on the eastern frontier, and of course the Roman Empire be begins in Greek life. So saying Greco-Roman makes a lot of sense here. Jews couldn't avoid this. When they executed Christ, the Pharisees were desperate. They saw the huge numbers of people who came out on Palm Sunday. They had to frighten them. They had to terrorize them into submission, which is what the very public murder and torture of Christ was meant to do, among many other things. I mean, one of the ways that the Cajal in Eastern Europe was able to maintain 
power over poor Jews who did not. Now, this is a this is a totally different group of people. Of course, these are Turks. I mean, you know, knowing almost nothing about Hebrew, the fact that they had to learn Hebrew, you know, shows you that this is a completely different group of people. But the way that they kept them loyal to the Kahal certainly was not money. It was stories of anti-Semitic uh, anti-Semitic peoples outside the 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 animalistic goyim that they're going to kill you no matter what. Even if you convert, they're going to kill you. They hate us. They hate us for no good reason. We're too wonderful. Whatever they said, this is what kept poor Jews in the Kahal. The wildly exaggerated stories, which they excel, about what life is like in the Gentile world. They're animals. They're subhuman. But one day, we will take over and rule them directly. Not there was some Messiah coming. Observant Jews were always a tiny minority. You know, by this time, by the time of Christ, it was a, you know, a, a social um, decision to reject the Greek world. You couldn't be Greek and Jewish at the same time, like it or not, even other people who attempted it. Christ was seen by the Sadducees and the Pharisees as a foreigner. Yes, he was educated in the temple, but they see him as another prophet, condemning his own people and turning to the Greco-Roman world within which he was born. I mean, Palestine was initially settled by Greeks. They settled in the, the Phoenician cities throughout the Mediterranean coast. And then, of course, founding new Greek cities inland. I mean, the economy and the legal system and everything else were based on the Greek model. This is where Christ was born. From the 3rd century BC, the Hellenization of, of Palestine was reinforced by a set of very pro-Greek monarchs and by the Roman administration, who really did have two official languages. They had to at the time. They made no um, concessions to any other group but the Greeks from which they derived. Now, Herod, of course, was always a, a Roman vassal, and he adopted Greek manners. By making his capital, first of all, naming it after a Roman emperor, or the reigning Roman emperor, and putting it deliberately on top of a cemetery that had Jewish and non-Jewish bodies in it, was a way to say, if you want to, you have to abandon Judaism. The ruling Jewish, Jewish elite was, was open to Hellenism, but the Pharisees were not. That was identical to apostasy. The Sadducees were atheists and materialists. There's no doubt about that. They disagreed quite vehemently with the Pharisees. But even there, how many of them actually believed in God how many of them saw the law as a way to maintain ethnic unity, that's a separate issue. If you were going to be economically active at all, you had to speak Greek. And, you know, multilingualism was the norm, I think. Mary is from Sepphoris. It's a Greek city. She had to have been fluent in the language. They may have been Old Testament and the prophets and the Psalms and, and the great stories of the Old they, they were loyal to this, but they were completely Greek in culture. Christ took the best of the prophets and merged them within a Greek milieu with his identity as Yahweh himself. Now, what's Aramaic? He spoke in Aramaic. He didn't speak in Hebrew. Aramaic was a language of the Persian Empire from roughly the 8th century BC. And Persian power made it dominant. Uh, in, and only in Judea, some Hebrew survived alongside Aramaic, uh, really up to the 2nd century AD. And the very fact that Hebrew was dying out should actually should tell you a lot. You couldn't have any relations with the government without speaking Greek. Um, any relations with Jews even outside Palestine required a command of Greek. In Egypt, for example, most of the Jews in Egypt knew only Greek, which culturally speaking meant they weren't Jews anymore. So they weren't observant Jews at all. And then Greek cities spring up in the countryside, um, and it was you know really an urban phenomenon. But Christ being a craftsman from that family, he did a lot of business in Sepphoris. He had no choice. That's where he was, he was raised. Uh, you know, not just being just outside. Nazareth being a tiny place. So any business that they did as a craftsman, he would have to. He had to have known Greek. And this is a culture that he sided with against the, the Pharisees. Now, um, in roughly 100 BC, the Hasmoneans, which is a Jewish priestly dynasty, had conquered Galilee uh, under uh, Aristobulus I. And um, the town had been run, you know, by, by a Jewish uh, kind of lower lord, middle of the first century BC, as the campaigns of, of Pompeii. Um, it fell under Roman rule, in other words, Greco-Roman rule, and the establishment of cities connected it with Rome and the wealthiest cities of the East, which were all Greek-speaking. So, Herod the Great recaptures a city in 37 BC. It had been garrisoned, really, or, you know, it had been made into a fortress by uh, Antigonus II Matthias, connected with the Persians. Then after that, Herod's death, um, 
the city was taken again by a bandit gang uh, in revolt against Herod's rule. But there was no ethnic concept to this, generally speaking. Now, Josephus says that the Roman governor had burnt the city to the ground and sold its inhabitants to slavery. After that, however, it became a Greek city and did not, and as proof of that, did not take part in any uh, subsequent uh, Jewish rebellions. Antipas was made Tetrarch, and then he changed the name to uh, Odocritorus, called it the Ornament of the Galilee. So the, the, the trade routes connecting Sephora to Ligio, and then to Samaria, this is what, this is what the Romans had created. The Greco-Latin world had created stability and the economic infrastructure there. That means the Pharisees and the Sadducees were decaying, seen as backwards, ignorant, and offered nothing in terms of economic incentives to remain. So killing someone like Christ was absolutely essential. This is what's going to happen to you. Though the lead weight that was found, dated to the first century, bears a Greek inscription. Now there's Jewish names on it, but because Jesus had to travel to Sepphoris for work, he knew the language. The, the, the lead weight was something you know, used you know, to, to weigh things, um, whether it be you know, wheat or whatever it is, and it had to be, so it was a very official official matter, had the Greek inscription. That means this was a dominant economic force. Uh, when I say that they didn't join the revolt, I'm talking about the Great Jewish Revolt in the 66. Sepphoris sided with Rome. Um, and really the city had been cleansed more than once of any militantly observant uh, Jewish element at all. But even in the Byzantine time, it was one of the major Greek cities of the East. Um, so Galilee, or Decapolis, under the administrative control of, of Syria. Um, and to some extent, at least, you know, prior to Christ, it was a Hasmonean or a, a Persian, uh, boundary area. And it was a way, the city was really founded by them to protect the caravan routes from, from attack. Um, but either way, Decapolis was a part of the so-called Syro-Phoenician, uh, economic world. So, Greco-Romans increased in numbers in Galilee, and the Phoenicians, you know, developed agrarian-based settlements um, or building fortresses. Um, but, of course, Herod was another matter. It was never meant to be water maintenance, so to speak, um, or really control at all in that regard. Rome was firm there, and Rome, as always, made it profitable to accept them. So around the time of the rebellion, I mean, how do we know how Greek sufferers was? Well, there were two things that existed there in Christ's time, a Roman theater and a Roman bathhouse. All kinds of, of Greco-Roman uh, icons of all sorts, all of whom, all of which depicting human figures, which of course was forbidden to Jews. All Greek developments. The divide was, in, in the Jewish mind, was between Sepphoris and Jerusalem. Trying to avoid connections with Rome brought you to Jerusalem, where Christ was executed. Where Christ was from, where he began his work in Capernaum, Sepphoris, was very anti-Jewish in that regard. It was Greco-Roman, and that was a massive cultural divide. Christ sided with Sepphoris and Capernaum. Um, the Roman-style theater there was most certainly visited by Jesus, which means that he was placed within the mainstream of Greek classical drama and comedy. In other words, he was part of the mainstream of Greek thought. And you know, there are documents comparing him to the cynics, not saying that he was one, but but compared with the, the so-called wandering countercultural preachers. And the city couldn't be a Jewish one because of all the finds showing, well, everything is Greek, but depictions of humans, animals, uh, uh, bronze figurines of Pan, Prometheus, um, and showing, of course, the Jews could have nothing to do with an area like that. Its Greek stamp was everywhere. Christ was as well-versed in ancient Greek culture as his mother was, as a man. Um, to the extent that the Herodians ruled, they Hellenized the city. I'll say it again. You can't be both Greek and Jewish. This should be obvious to some people. In, ac in academia, it's not. But you can't be both. There's no separation between religion and, and ethnicity. There. And to the extent that the town did not engage in the Great Revolt, that brought them closer and closer and closer to Greek culture. Um, Dio Caesarea, uh, in Hadrian's time, um, which is a connection of both Roman Emperor and, and Zeus. Um, but there was, after Christ, following the revolt 132, 136, when Judea was devastated, there was some settlement there by Jews. And in fact, uh, part of the Talmud was written there. Uh, Yehuda Hansi, 
and the Mishnah was partly put together in Sepphoris. But this is a century, a century and a half after after Christ. So in the Jewish mind at the time, there was really parts of Jerusalem that were seen as you know quasi Persian uh, Jewish on the one hand, and on the other, Sepphoris, Capernaum, under the Herodians, Greco Roman. It was a massive divide. This is why Christ was considered a foreigner. This is why they kept referring to him as a Nazarene. The Compolis was not much of a Jewish area. Because it became a, a metropolis for commerce, being Greek paid off. I mean, you, you hear in the literature, you know, Greek and Jewish influences uh, blended together. Well, theologically speaking, that's not possible. To the extent that it happened, that just shows you how weak the Pharisaical control over the Jews at the time were. Their control over the Jews of Sepphoris was, was non-existent. You can't be a good Jew and use that money. You can't be a good Jew and support Rome and Herod, as many of them did. Herod's successors, I mean. Roughly at the time of Christ. Well, you know, even at the end of the, throughout the Byzantine era, you know, it, it maintained its, its population, mostly Hellenized, about 30,000 people. The urban planning of the city, where Mary was born, where Christ was raised, the streets were laid out on a grid. This is a classic Greco-Roman urban planning. Uh, the Basilica on the Eastern Plateau uh, from the first century. Not This is not a Christian building, but it's certainly Roman. Um, Antipas used his father's palace at Sepphoris, where he created a whole new foundation, Tiberias. Both places were completely Greco-Roman, and because they used uh, faces on their money, and so much has been uncovered showing that it's not a Jewish area. Tiberius used Greek titles for positions. Agoranomoi, for example, the boule, the dikaprotoi. The entire apparatus was Greek. And of course, the forest did the same thing, because they were very close. They were under the same dynasty. Tiberius even acquired a fully Greek stadium, or I should say a Roman stadium. And what Antipas was trying to do was express this fact that he is a sophisticated Roman. And the revolt was as much against him as Rome in the abstract. But it's even deeper than this. Close by the city of Magdala, um, the uh, architecture used Roman columns. Now, um, Upper Galilee was another matter. It, it was not, was, wasn't well populated and had no major cities. Still, though, you have Greek finds, finds throughout the area, on, on digs there. Both Sepphoris and Tiberias, sister cities, had Greek schools, provided basic elementary training and rhetoric and philosophy. This means that the region was mentally Greek, not just physically Greek. And, you know, the whole notion of his communicating with Gentiles, you know, the Syrophoenician woman, the Centurion in Capernaum, Pontius Pilate, etc. Pontius Pilate's attempt to save him, which, you know, the Jews wish that we didn't know about. This is why, you know, Pope of Rome and everyone else are trying to rewrite the Bible, get rid of the prophets, and certainly get rid of the, the, the clear, historically accurate concept that the Jews used the Romans, who they actually hated, and use lies to get people like Christ in trouble, or John the Baptist in trouble. There'd be absolutely no reason for a Roman administration, or even Antipas, to have any problem with Christ. And the only reason that he was executed reluctantly was that the Jews threatened to make up stories. And you see this, you know, the way that the Jews operate today, making up stories about someone saying that he's a revolutionary, you need to get rid of him, pretending to be, pretending to be patriots all of a sudden. One lie after another. Their biggest problem with Christ is that he was pro-Roman. So they had to go to the Romans and make up stories. And God knows what they said. We know um, that just before the, the execution, the Jews said, if you don't kill this man, we're going to go to Caesar and tell him that you're no friend of his, that you're allowing this revolutionary to roam free. Of course, they were the revolutionaries. They hated the Roman Empire and were very soon going to revolt against it. That same chutzpah exists today. Unfortunately, that carried over. Nothing else did, but that carried over. Whatever you find in Sepphoris and Tiberias, you find Greek schools, you find Greek education, Greek architecture, Greek everything. This means that Christ was, as a man, fully aware and deep within the mentality of the Greek world. Who did he fight? The Greeks? The Romans? No. He openly sided with them. He fought the Pharisees. In other words, he is saying the chosen people are now this European group. Decapolis was a part of Europe, not a part of what we call today the third world. It certainly is today, but the looks that I get when I explain to people that much of the world 
2,000 years ago doesn't look like it does today. You have tenured historians who have never heard this before. No, it's a very different place. Europe included all of North Africa and most of the Levant. All of its cities were Greco-Latin. And I'll say it again, to trade, to travel, to do anything, to do it, to fish, pottery, selling any of this stuff, beyond debate, you had to know Greek. One of the most important elements here is the coinage. A big problem, economic problem, that the Pharisees had, so-called observant Jews, which is just following the law mechanically, they didn't believe in the lawgiver anymore, that's pretty clear, was the fact that they couldn't do business in the town. I mean, Tiberius was out of the question, but even Sepphoris, where the money was deliberately coined with the emperor's face on Both cities, their coins bore the emperor's portrait. The very fact that they stamped coin this way meant not so much that they were kicking the Jews out, just as the Jews weren't that important. The Jews that existed were nominal, which were, of course, one of the, the, the early core of, of Christ's following, other than the, the apostles were mostly Greeks. They, or they, at least I have Greek names. But um, how powerful could the Jews have been if even the local Tetrarch is minting coins with people's pictures on it? You know the Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to read this to you because this is, again, one of the many misinterpreted parts of the Bible. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him, Jesus. They sent their stooges to him, along with followers of Herod. Remember, those two were enemies. And they said, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, which they did not believe. You teach the way of God in accordance with truth. You're just flattering them. And you show deference to no one. In other words, you're not a Jewish nationalist. You don't regard people with partiality. Same thing. So tell us, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to this test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin. And they brought him a denarius. He said, Whose face is this on here? They answered, Well, it's the emperor's. Then he said, Give therefore to the emperor things that are his, and to gods that are gods. They went away amazed, and they left him. Now, I've said many times, that as society goes farther and farther and farther away from the ancient model, picking up a Bible and reading it will lead to nothing but destruction. The anti-culture that we live in has created voids for conscience and intellect. There is no connection between how we live and the era of the Bible, either secular or religious way. Now, the first question is, how is this a method of entrapment? It's primarily because the coin had Tiberius's head on it. For Jews to use this coin was blasphemy. So he was deliberately spitting on the Pharisaic culture in this respect. And by the way, also give permission for icons, because no Jew could touch a coin that had human representation on it. But it was legal tender, anyway, which proves the area wasn't Jewish. Now, idiots today read that with no knowledge, and they say, well, this is about church and state. Like like that Leninist dictum, which was his the exact wording of the law, um, had anything to do with this. No church father in the ancient world saw it this way. It was Christ's loathing of the decaying and pompous Jewish ruling class that he was, by the way, dismantling. So there were two traps. Trap number one is using the currency at all and accepting it, its value, and the face stamped on it, which obviously he did. That was a huge middle finger to Judaism at the time. But then the other trap was, if he rejected it on the grounds that it showed someone's face, or even just that the Roman Empire was illegitimate, they'd run to Herod, and run to the Romans and say, he's revolutionary. Um, and either a Jewish nationalist or an anti-Jewish nationalist, one way or the other. Um, so if he says that the representation was okay, Rome had a legitimate right to rule. If he said no, they can go to Rome. So either he was going to piss off the Jews or the Romans. He decided to piss off the Jews. And to a great extent... It's really a backhanded compliment to the Herodians as well. The very fact that he said this is a legitimate coin, that was the issue. But they went away amazed. That's an odd way of putting it. What amazed them? What amazed them is that he had just openly repudiated the Jewish ruling class. And he openly and loudly sided with Rome. As I said, the prophet said the same thing. Jeremiah went to the Babylonians and sided with them as they sacked Israel. This is why the Talmud condemns the prophets. Being amazed didn't mean they were satisfied. They were shocked at his apostasy from the Jewish nationalist point of view. 
But no scholar in ancient history today is going to be able to understand that. But if these guys can understand it, how much more can some benighted American postmodern be? They'll do nothing but read what they want into these kind of statements. Right, even in, in Bible Gateway, which is a website that has every translation of the Bible on there, and I, I use it all the time, that chapter is headed with the phrase, a question about paying taxes, as if taxes were the issue. He openly pointed to Europe as a new carrier of the faith. And this Roman idea was to be found both in Western Rome, of course Rome itself, Byzantium or Eastern Rome, and Moscow, the third Rome. Christianity and the Greek life were one and the same. The first, whatever it is, 20, at least 20 popes spoke Greek. It wasn't really until Justinian that Latin really mattered in the West. Um, the popes were all came from Greek areas. I mean, Latin uh, religiously mattered. Very few church fathers that were spoke Latin at the time. Tertullian and then Augustine. It was Greek speaking. The ancient church was Greek. That means Galilee, or Decapolis, was Greek. Icons were permitted and Judaism repudiated. Christ deliberately allowed that trap to be sprung. There was nothing he could say. And that, that was actually the point of it. Now, they had plotted his death long, long before then. But Christ was saying that this coin is legitimate, the emperor is legitimate, and its value is based on something real. And in, in that case, the state. But this is an important reason why the Jews hated him to the point of wanting him tortured to death. And it's why the Roman administration refused to execute him. Christ spoke Latin or Greek to Pilate. I'm assuming it was Latin, and of course, there were three languages over Christ's head on the cross. Now, the coins and sufferers, um, they have Trajan's trade, uh, face on it, though the one that Christ's talking about had um, 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 Tiberius's face on it. But what we found, there's four that have been found relatively recently. It has Trajan's face on it, and it has, in archaic Greek, the emperor Trajan, prov or, it, the emperor gave, the emperor provides, which was the archaic form of you know, the emperor has coined this money, therefore it's legitimate. That's what that would mean in the sense. And then the reverse bore the city's ethnic label, and either one of four symbols, a laurel wreath, the very Roman, two ears of grain or corn, a palm tree. Um, but there's not, nothing unique here. It's just that this couldn't have been a Jewish area. Now the concept that the emperor Trajan provided or donated or gave or means that his power was behind it. These weren't coins that any Jew could use. It's because Sephora wasn't Jewish. There was another found recently um, that has Zeus seated, I think probably most people think it's Zeus seated in this kind of Tetra-style temple, which makes sense for a region called um, Caesarea, or Decapolis, I'm sorry, that was later changed to Dio Caesarea. There was another that shows the uh, Capitan Triad, Jupiter, Juno, Minerva, and again, the same Tetra-style temple. And it's just another statement um, of that region's pro-Roman, pro-Greek mentality. The point here is that for a very, very long time, it was held that Sephorus was a Jewish area. Um, I guess before the 20th century, but now no one believes that. No one, however, has taken the um, obvious conclusion from this, that Christianity is Greek, not Hebraic or Persian, and it's part of European culture. Because there is no Europe without Greece. This was the initial foundation of it. That was repudiated, by the way, at the late Renaissance, early Enlightenment. So you have a completely schizophrenic society. When someone says, I support European society, okay, you have to explain what you mean. You're talking about Augustine? Or are you talking about Francis Bacon? They have nothing in common. The Enlightenment was meant and actually expressed at the time as a break with European culture, and a hatred of the Greeks, especially Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle was more dominant than Plato at the time, but the very concept of an essence that's eternal, that defines an object, was completely outlandish. These were nominalists, these were, or phenomenalists, even worse, and nothing except the human mind, or their elite mind, the initiated mind, the gold brain, um, is permissible. Now, they took that from Plato, but completely redefined it. Plato and the late Renaissance or the Enlightenment have absolutely nothing in common. Some of the early alchemists took from Plato, but this was the Neoplatonic movement, not Plato as such. But once Sepphoris was excavated over time, talking just a mile from Nazareth, everything that they're overturning says is Greek, Roman architecture, Greco-Roman art, everywhere. 
every everything that, that, that they are overturning, and these digs shows that this was a Greek area. It was known in the ancient world, but not only were the Jews not significant in the area, although there were plenty of them, it's that those who were there weren't observant. There was, there's absolutely no evidence that their lawyers said it's okay to use this coin. None. Or to go to a place like Tiberius. Now, another argument, of course, is that Greek and Aramaic complemented one another. Well, that depends on what you think the Persians are. Either way, Greco-Roman architecture dotted the landscape everywhere. Artistic depictions of emperors were everywhere. This is what Christ saw every day of his life growing up. The Acropolis, the Galilee, and Sephoris were Greek. I mean, you could even go so many... But, you know, the area ceased to be Israelite at the destruction of the Northern Kingdom. And even as late as the Maccabean era, the settlers there were so few that, you know, Simon brought them all the way for safety, took them away from the area for safety in, in 1 Maccabees, chapter 5. So between that time and the days of Christ, um, what Jews were there became Hellenized. That's been downplayed. Uh, one, one scholar says this, between that time and the days of Christ, the Jewish inhabitants of Galilee must have flourished exceedingly, but under conditions which would encourage independence of character, resourcefulness, and readiness to defend themselves and their property. In other words, they were not dependent on the law. They weren't dependent on the Pharisees. They were independent of Jerusalem. The foundation is that Sepphoris emerged as a crossroads that linked Greco-Roman civilization with the indigenous culture, whether it be Persian or Semitic. If Christ wanted to be connected with Jewish culture, he would have been in Jerusalem, not um, Caesarea. The Sephora's excavations shown us what Christ really wants, but has long since been forgotten, at least since the late Enlightenment, where the Jewish element of, of Christ has been exaggerated out of proportion. Modern Judaism rejects the Old Testament. I don't know, I have to explain this to people. The Talmud is not a secret book. I know it's hard to read and it goes on forever, but they condemn the prophets because they, in fact, condemned Israel. If there is one message of the Talmud, and all of its massive volumes, if there's one message, and I'm, because I'm crazy, been through them all, some most are incredibly boring, but every once in a while you come across something. So it's one message. It's that we no longer believe in God, or that we are God. God is not going to save us. The very fact that the Pharisees had to murder Christ to get their point across, Shows you how decadent they had become. Palm Sunday scared the crap out of the fact. They, they were frightened of, of John the Baptist and Christ anyway. They knew that he was popular. They saw the miracles. Right? I mean, this is something, it's a very simple question a few people ask. They saw Christ perform miracles. They saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. They witnessed this with their own eyes. Well, they tried to think that he was summoning demons, but he knocked that out of the park. The only other option is that they had abandoned God. And they had made some deal with Lucifer to grant them some kind of power, but of course they had to murder Christ. It's not too long after Lucifer approached Christ. He couldn't have known who he was, but knew he was someone of significance. And what did he offer? All the kingdoms of the world. All he had to do, worship me. Now I don't know exactly what that meant, but put me as supreme in your mind at the very least. They knew that Christ either was God or had tremendous divine favor and was doing miracles. This they knew for a fact. So they had to reject them. They only had, they had to have rejected God at the same time. And Judaism, of course, was never the same. The Old Testament was burnt, and what we now know as the Talmud was slowly but surely put together after the Romans finally had their way with them. One of the great curse words, now they have different code words for this, but even the Jewish encyclopedia, you need the Jewish encyclopedia in order to read the Talmud. Because they'll tell you the truth. Because the Talmud was written with a lot of code words, uh, unsure who was going to read it. But the, the Jewish encyclopedia will clarify some of these things. Rome is receives their most vicious condemnation. Now, the reason might be obvious here. But Christ associated himself with the Romans and backed Roman rule. So Christ was hated more than anybody. They knew he was God or a very, very powerful prophet. He called himself God, as he said, before the, before Moses and the prophets was, I am. I am is just another word for Yahweh. And they picked up stones to try to kill him. They didn't say that he was crazy though. They didn't say that he was, he was off, that he was some, some criminal nut job. They never said that. No, they knew he was very sane. But 
In order to maintain their power, they had to have made some kind of deal. And Christ was aware of this. Um, the point of all of this, of course, is that Christianity is, by its very foundation and structure, Greek. It's not the same. The mentality of the prophets, the Psalms, the great stories of, um, you know, David, etc., um, aren't a huge part of it, of course. These are, this is, this is inspired scripture. But as St. Justin Martyr says, the writers there were in much contact with the Greek world as Christ himself was. Justin Martyr is one of my favorite church fathers. He was very early, one of the earliest, in fact. He was just post apostolic. But he was also a Platonist. And he says what I say. Going from Plato to Christ is really, really easy. All you have to do is take the form of the good and put a personality on it. Well, if it has that much content, that much power, why wouldn't it have a personality? Why would it have everything but a personality? That doesn't make any sense. Adding a personality to something doesn't take away from it. It adds to it. It seems that the Enlightenment mentality supports ideas so long as they don't have a personality attached to them. The difference between an idea and a superstition is just a personality. That an idea can make decisions. Well, we know that ideas are very autonomous in the human mind. They do have personality. But that's just a, a bizarre uh, superstition of, of the positivist world. But one of the major theses of Justin Martyr is that the Old Testament writers were deeply involved with Greek culture. They had to have been. Greek was simply too dominant in the area. I mean, yes, Alexander was, was the... Um, you know, the invasion was literally, you know, they just poured in after that. But but even before, it was very, very clear. Um, you know, the Greeks had the Danoi, the tribe of Dan. You know, there was very, very close connections between those two. Now, because of certain purity concerns, they made, made themselves as autonomous as possible. Stealing, you know, Greek myths and stuff like that will get you stoned, which is why it didn't happen. You know, that will guarantee you to get murdered. But that's exactly what Christ did. He saw the truth in this. I think Justin Martyr will say, making that jump is very easy. And in some churches you will see, uh, well, I could, I could show you. I, in fact, on this very program, I've shown icons, um, not with halos or anything, but icons of Hesiod and Homer as prophets for the Gentiles, which is another word of saying, another way of saying prophets for the Greeks. Of course, the great prophets of the Old Testament were far closer to God than they were. But the underlying metaphysical truths of Plato, with some, uh, some exceptions, of course, you know, even Justin Martyr will say this. Plato made errors just like we all do. But the underlying metaphysical message is clear. When I first read Plato for the first time, I read a intellectual, secular justification for the spiritual world. I was only 17 at the time. I wasn't quite sure what I was. But I certainly wasn't a materialist. So, and again, I couldn't express it like that, you know, like I could today. But it wasn't until I read Plato my freshman year in college, um, on my own, of course, the, the Republic, for the first time, I saw the ideas or the forms, the archetypes of all creation as uh, spiritual entities explained in rational, secular terms. And I was never the same again. The first two works of philosophy I ever read, well, first was the Gorgias, but the Gorgias really doesn't have the ideas in it so much. But then the Republic after that, and of course the two fit together very well. The notion of what a sophist was, they were similar to the Sadducees. They um, really believed in nothing except power. The Sadducees proved that you, know, you could be a Jew and an atheist at the same time because they were atheists. This is why they were rivals to the Pharisees. In other words, following the law had nothing to do with God, had nothing to do with, with even natural law. It was a marker for ethnic separatism. So you see, that jump doesn't take long from the Sadducees and the decaying Pharisees into the Babylonian Talmud. God has abandoned us, so we will abandon him. And by the way, the Babylonians aren't so bad. The other point here, of course, is that even the Jews that existed outside of Jerusalem, very few were observant. The, um, the Mishnah was written after Christ's time, of course. The Talmud wouldn't make any sense without Christ. Um, so there was a, a um, you know, refugees moving in after, after the Romans uh, dealt with them. But Sepphoris always maintained its loyalty. It was not a Jewish area. And you had plenty of people who, like Christ, were Jews from birth, but absolutely culturally Greeks. He had to have been. But the act, among many other things, but the one act here that matters is taking that coin. They were amazed what Christ had said here. 
And of course, in a way, he's saying that he's God, because only, only a God could do that and get away with it. And then call himself God shortly thereafter, referring to himself as, as Yahweh or I am. Christ went to the Greek theater. It's been uncovered in Sephirates from Christ's time. Maybe in Capernaum as well. These are all Greek areas. This is where the Holy Family's from. So this all means, we all come down to it, that Christianity is European at its very root. You take the Greek mentality in both literature and philosophy, connect it with the ancient prophets, who I think were connected anyway, and you wrap it all up with Christ being God, and there you have the faith. It solves all philosophical problems. And even the problems that Plato's forms or archetypes raise are solved when you place them as created entities within Logos or Christ himself. Christ as a man was Greek. I'm not saying he was genetically Greek, if that even mattered at the time. But that was his culture and that was his life after he got out of the temple. As you know, a relative of David, he would, he would be able to do that. But where he's from in his entire life and the way he behaved, he couldn't have been any more Greco-Roman. Which is why one of the many reasons the Pharisees despised him and why the Talmud condemns both Christ and Rome and treats them as one and the same. Like they even had a substantial cult of the emperor in Greek Sephiroth. A Greek life dominated over the fragmented, arrogant rule of the Pharisees every time. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, had abandoned the prophets, and what it became was an insular, inbred group of people who needed to use violence to keep their people from following Christ and following the mentality of the Greco-Roman world, which was everywhere. One of the dominant Jewish teachings in the concept of Rodef, which Michael Hoffman had taught me many years ago, Rodef is a Jew that turns in another Jew to law enforcement. It means you're dead. It means you could be killed without any repercussions. Any Jew who talks to an outsider and condemns another Jew in the process is Rodef and is in serious trouble. This is why their organized crime is so powerful. Nothing has changed in that regard. There's a journalistic, ideological connection, but certainly not a theological or a, or a uh, ethnic one. You compare that to the victories of whether it be the imperial cult or Greek life and Greek thought, and the choice is obvious. The result, of course, was the accursed Talmud. Our faith, the faith of the Orthodox, is Greek. It's Levantine. And this is what Christ accepted and spit on the pharisaical ruling class that later manifested in the Talmud, which is the demon's own handwriting. Thank you for listening, everyone. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.